Doing a shallow ah, bowl there it is. with an embellished rim. Okay. Mm. So I brought a couple of examples. Um, <clears throat> this one I did for a demo up north. Took some ebony wax and worked it into the rim after I turned it. I really like that contrast. I mean, most of the time, I don't do a lot of embellishments on wood. I like wood because I like wood. So if the wood has any figure at all, I pretty much just live with it and leave it alone because that's, that's what I like. But once in a while you get a piece and, and it's just bland enough. It's certainly worth uh, doing a little something too. And tonight we're going to do this, which is a rope figuring around the outside edge of the rim. And uh, I'm going to do this with a spiraling tool. Is everybody familiar with the spiraling tool? No? Okay. Well, um, spiraling tool has a cutting head. And that cutting head rotates as the wood turns. And if you were really good, you could probably do the math and figure out where each of these teeth is going to hit. But if you don't like to think that hard, you try it. If it doesn't work, you just clean your surface and start a little bit over from that. Or if you're on a circular piece, a cylinder piece, you would just change your diameter slightly until you got there. So this is a piece that is pretty beat up. It's, it's a tool handle. It's not, not for pretty. But uh, it'll give you an example of what can be done with this particular tool. That's cool. And we'll play with that and I can answer any questions you might have about it. Um, but this piece of wood was, it has a little figure, but relatively bland. And I just thought, well, this would be a nice piece to do a feature on. So, I'm going to pass that one around as well. Now that <coughs> shaped bowl, a little bit light. light. Well, you want an even wall thickness. No matter what kind of bowl you have, you want an even wall thickness because that wood is going to expand and contract every time the humidity changes. And as long as you get the entire piece expanding and contracting the same amount, you've got a fighting chance of not having something crack up. But if you leave a really heavy bottom, I know a lot of turners say, well, I want a heavy bottom because I don't want it to tip over. Then you're more apt to have a crack in that piece. So you try to keep that wall thickness as consistent as you can get it. Um, this particular shape, I know Jimmy Clues does this shape a lot. A lot of turners like this shape. And when I was going to teach classes, I would advertise that I was doing a serpentine bowl because my go-to guy called it a serpentine bowl because he thought that Roman OG was like a, a serpent, right? And nobody signed up for the class. <laughs> and I was like, what do you call this anyway? So I called it a wide rim shallow bowl. And I got a lot of people signing up for the class, so <laughs> go figure. But uh, I, I've heard it referred to as a spaghetti bowl. I don't know why. Okay, for those of you who haven't seen me turn before, I enjoy heckling, feel free. Okay, so I'm gonna start out here. I already done it wrong because I brought my chuck, but I didn't bring the right adapter for it. So I brought a one-way chuck. So now we're gonna use my one-way worm in the Nova chuck and we'll see what happens. Okay, so I'm starting out with a worm screw. Um, this is the one-way worm screw. It is not the worm screw that came with the Nova chuck. So it takes a 3 8 inch bit. The Nova takes a 5 16 I think. Anybody familiar with it? So... My very precise uh, drill press there. I have some trouble with the, with the worm screw stripping out. Does it? Does it you know, and, and I, I didn't bring any tonight, but typically I would put a little paste wax on there. You know, paraffin wax will work, but you end up pushing it out of the way. A little paste wax goes a long ways. And, and I should have brought that tonight. You don't have any here, do you? Sure. Uh, bottom drawer, I think. So I'm just going to put a little, just a little, not much. And that's going to make a world of difference. Okay. There it is. Okay. Okay, 
right hand turn. Uh huh. Chucky, Chucky. Lefty, tiny, righty, Lucy, right? That uh, that worm screw is not it has a, a flange on it, and that got caught in there, so that caused me a little grief. So those of you who've seen me turn before, you know I really don't. I'm not fond of reverse. Chucking. I'll do it at the end of my demo um, if I need to, but if I can, I will cut against the grain even if the wood will take that. Some wood doesn't, right? This is very soft. It's not going to take an against the grain cut. Um, because every time you reverse chuck, you always have that little bit of imperfection that works in there, right? Uh, this time, I'm planning to reverse chuck this one twice, and I'll tell you why as we get there. So, I'm a little discouraged that I, I didn't bring the right adapter to use my, my chuck that I've done this before with, but uh, we'll endure. First, let's make sure we're round before I do that. Gertrude up. Okay, anytime I can, I want to use my tailstock, especially when I'm demonstrating, and our speed. Optical illusion there. But I don't want to set my center point until the piece is rotating. If I do, it will have a tendency to follow the grain. If it's spinning, when I set that in there, I have a far better chance of having no problems there. <clears throat> okay, for hogging time, you want to use your largest tool, and then as we get to more refined cuts, we'll move to a smaller tool. Sure enough, that soft wood just wants to tear out at the end grain, just as you'd expect. But if I bump, bump down to a smaller tool with less cutting edge exposed, I can get rid of most of that cut out. Now, do I need to do this? No, most of this is going to go away. Are you using a slicing cut on that? What's that? Are you using a slicing cut? Yes, yes. I'm using a sheer cut, right? I still got a little tear out, but you know what? Like I say, most of it's going to go away. Okay, so anytime you want to see what your cut is, you can always just turn the lathe by hand, right? So if I'm turning at a 45 degree angle, I'm looking for that curvicue to stay on the floor. 
I'm looking to get this. All right? Yeah, it's gonna fall apart by the time it gets back here, three people. But uh, by holding the tool, so the cutting edge is touching the wood at a 45 degree angle. I want that 45 degree angle. That's my shear, right? And I can hold the tool up there. I always intentionally touch the heel first and then swing it around until it starts to cut. And once it starts to cut, I stay with that angle and I can get a uh, nice long curly cue there. It's gonna break when it gets to the end grain. Yeah. So, uh, it's gonna try to get you a nice long one there, but I didn't get there. But that's, that's the idea behind it. By having that shearing cut, you got a fighting chance to get rid of that tear out, okay? And then, you know, every gouge, every tool, the deeper the flute, the more material's gonna hog away, the shallower the flute, the more refined the cut's gonna be. And that's why a skew has a very fine cut because it has no flute to speak of, right? So if I go to my spindle gouge instead of my bowl gouge, I will get an even more refined cut. And again, now we're just kind of fussing because eventually we're going to cut most of this away. So when I finish that, now almost all that end grain is, is gone. Um, got a little bit of tear out here, opposite of it, hardly anything on that side. It takes me forever to sand out. Yeah, that, that's the idea is you don't, you don't sand, you make your curly cues and, and you cut, right? Okay, so now I'm going to come around here. And I'm going to go ahead and make a tenon for the back side of this. And that's why I said I'm going to end up uh, reverse checking a couple times. I want a little bit of mass to it when I'm using this tool. Because you have to apply a little bit of force with this tool. If you get it thin first, I don't know. I never tried it that way. But uh, there's a reason I never tried it that way because I don't think it would work. <laughs> it, would, it would flex and it would give you that bouncing you know that you get which I don't think would be too conducive so I'm just gonna put a tenon on here real quick and since these are dovetails and a specific size get a mark real quick here kind of give me an idea is that right that looks very small to me but, uh, yeah, I'm just used to that other chuck. I like this, this hidden speed. That's kind of cool. Now you can always make that internal um, mortise type. To grip, but uh, this piece of wood is plenty thick enough that I didn't see any any real reason to do that. Uh, got lots of mass here. So I always consider my tenon to be detailed work. So I'm going to use my detailed gouge.
and this is a 15 degree dovetail if I remember correctly and that is only 14 and a half degrees of course it's not critical especially with this soft of wood because it doesn't matter what I do when I pull it down I'm going to crush fibers right um, so the most important thing to me is to mark it so when I come back and put it in the tin and put it in the chuck a second time it cocks the same way that it cocked the first time because I'm going to turn, turn it round no matter what I did on the tenon or how I crushed the fibers. If it cocks it off a little bit, that's fine as long as when I put it back in there, I'm consistent. Right? Okay. Now we could have removed as much material as we wanted, right? It really is not that important at this point. All I want to make sure is when I put it back on here, I get everything back as close as possible. So, lefty tidy, righty loosey, right? All right. I just can't. I can't do it. <laughs> It should be a one way. I just can't do it. I'll leave that there because I'm going to use that again. And this is why they make handles with that slide. If this were much taller, I'd be running into the wood here with the handle. All right, so the most important part anytime you're going to chuck is that face surface. We didn't talk about that. And you guys probably know all this stuff. But this surface right here is machined. It's flat. The surface down below here where the screws are and whatnot, not so perfect. So I never want to dead end my tenon into that bottom. I want to be just a little short of that bottom. And I want to have a very crisp uh, juncture here. So I have a good flat spot, at least an eighth of an inch out. Because I want it to set flush on those jaws. And like a mortise and tenon, that's what's going to give me my real strength. And typically, if I were turning some very dense wood or something, I would, uh, I would not trust this. I would use a waste block. Because this tenon, my grains go in this direction, the same as the bowl. If I take a very heavy cut, I can shear that tenon right off, especially when I'm using dovetail jaws because the force is already up in there just like a chisel would be if you put a chisel in there and hit it with a mallet. So, Does it make a difference on the size of the tenon? Well, yes it does and that's very important. So if you, we've got time, which I think we have a little bit of time here, let's talk about that for a second. Okay, so this is the Nova Chuck, and this is the one way Chuck. So when they're both closed, they both pretty much form a circle. I really need to clean this Chuck, it's pretty obvious here. Okay, but you can see in this Nova Chuck, you've got pretty much a perfect circle here, right? But on the one way, each jaw has these two reversed um, curvature that points outward towards your work, okay? This 15 degree angle, this is flat, but it's also serrated teeth. And if you can see that, I only see where it says photo upside down right there. But uh, as this one opens up,
If I make a tenon this size and I clamp down on it, I'm going to only hit these eight points on the outside edge. I'm not going to engage any of this other surface. But it doesn't matter what size tenon I make with my one way, it has the same holding power, it has the same eight reversed curves. So I find it to be far more reliable. And again, now I'm not pushing like a dovetail up into that grain that is, is um, in the same orientation that could shear off easily. I'm gripping more now. I still do a bit of a dovetail with these. I'm not going to do 15 degrees. I'm going to do 3, 5 degrees, something like that. Because I know I'm going to mesh some fibers anyway. And I just seem the tail end be bigger than the front end to keep it from wanting to come out. But uh, I, I trust these jaws quite a bit more. Now all of that having been said, the Nova Chuck is very popular chuck because it's a pretty good entry level price. Now on these G3s, or this G3 here and this scroll, you can buy one ways talon chuck jaws and get these same serrations and you can replace those on on your Nova chucks. I don't know if it'll work on the Supernova, it's a little bigger, but I know it will work on this G3. So this is going to be the front of our bolt. So let's true it up, hope it's not out too far. As long as it's out the same on the back and the front, I'm okay. Oh, I didn't do what I said I was going to do, though, did I? And you guys let me get away with it. Shame on you. Uh, get my handy-dandy pencil here. And I'm going to mark the number one jaw. Because when I put it back in here again, if, it, if it's cranked just a little bit, I'm going to turn it to that. So I want it to go back in exactly the same way it is right now. Okay. the center because I want my wormhole to be the same don't I so yeah I didn't cut too much off I just uh okay. all right so I have a nice smooth surface here a little out just take my spindle gouge and just make it perfect I'm sorry? Why did you use a spindle gouge? Spindle gouge has a shallower flute. Shallow, the more shallow my flute is, the smoother my cut's going to be. Okay. We're not going to go over this far, but... Anytime I can get those curly cues, I'm a happy guy. Okay. okay. So now we're going to pull this <coughs> smooth surface, the clean surface there. We'll pull the spiraling tool out. That spiraling tool is a lot of fun. Um, you can do a lot of things with it. And I was making a spiral pattern like that piece I passed around. So I have it set on the number two setting. But if I do that here, it's not going to look like a rope. It's going to be too, too straight across. So I'm going to tip it over to the three set. Can you see the little numbers right there? So you got a gauge 
that you can reset it the same way. And then you've got zero at center, and you can set it the same number left or right of center. So if you want that pineapple kind of thing, you can come in one direction and then rotate it the opposite and come back the other direction and get that hash pineapple kind of effect. So I need to adjust this back to the three for this, which is not, yes, it's got to be, no, it's not. Okay, so I'm going to rotate this around to at the three. And tighten this back down. Now, I was watching a Sorby rep do a demo on this once, and he was complaining because sometimes the rotation of the tool will cause the screw to back off. And he said, well, just always present it in, in one direction that tightens the screw, which is great, but then you can't get a spiral the other direction, right? So if you look at staircases, sometimes you'll see uh, spirals on the balusters and the spirals will go one direction on one side and the opposite direction on the other side, right? So one's a left hand and one's a right hand spiral. And that's based on up. So if it's up and to the right, it's a right-hand spiral. If it's up and to the left, it's a left-hand spiral. So we want this cutting edge to be just about center. Always seems a little lower than center to get it started. Works the best. We're going to slow our RPMs down here. We weren't running that fast, but you know, for a cylinder shape, obviously, um, you're working with smaller diameter, your speed, your surface speed per minute is less. As you get bigger, your surface speed per minute gets more. So it's hard to, you know, the instructions say seven to eight hundred RPM, but is that a two inch diameter piece or is that a 10 inch diameter piece, right? So it's really surface feet per minute that matter. So we're gonna fuss with it here. And again, if anybody wants to sit down and do the math of each of these teeth and where it's gonna hit and when I come back to the full circle, you're welcome to do that math. I'm just gonna try it here. take a look and actually we did pretty good we have a little hash in between so it's having a hard time getting started but the trick is once you get it right then you want to gently come in here and get it to fall back into the same tooth pattern it had before okay now I'm really a little further in than I want to be I'm going to come out here and try it again. And we'll see what we did out there. I didn't move that much further out, did I? Okay. But I've got a decent tooth pattern. Now this is, this is kind of a funny story too. This cutter, um, you can sharpen it by taking a stone. <coughs> And as it's rotating, if I come in here to, to an area that we're not going to work with here and force it to rotate, that's hard to hold on to that way. You can come in here and lay your stone on the flat bevel as it's rotating, and it will sharpen that. Now I was doing that with cuts just the one corner. The top surface, the entire round top surface cuts. Each of these teeth cuts. Okay. So you want it to be sharp everywhere along that surface. Okay. So when you sharpen it, right, if you were holding it by hand, you'd be doing this. Okay. Right, that bevel. 
the, so, the back side of that tooth is just meat then. Back here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's sharpening right there. Now I was sharpening with the 600 grit stone and I use this a lot and it wasn't working so well and I thought well you know I've been using it for years and I do use it a lot. I didn't tell you but there's a bearing built into the center of this. It's on a bearing. It's not just uh, running on the shaft of the screw. The smaller version does run on the shaft of the screw. So this just runs on that brass edge, that brass screw, okay? This one actually has a bearing built into it. So I ordered a replacement. And when I got my replacement, all of a sudden it had very sharp points to it. Well, if you want to fall back into these same grooves over and over again, that very sharp point wants to dig in and it was tearing the heck out of the softer wood where this one each tooth is a little bit relieved okay. so it's not as square as that one is so i sent an email to uh yeah if you drop it i'm sure it will shatter <laughs> no it's not carbide but it wouldn't do it any good. So I wrote an email to, to Sorby and said, Hey guys, what, what's going on here? I think I ordered the wrong part number. I want the one that's a little bit rounded on the edge because it drops back in very easily. And I got an email back that said, Well, the tool that made those broke about 12 years ago and we bought a new tool and it makes them square. Oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try to drop it 